Good morning. We are here to, uh, my name is E. David Smith and this is my colleague Dror Footer. And uh, we're going to give you a little, some pointers. Now we gave out a handout and the goal is that you only look at the side with the blanks because our goal here is in the next few minutes to talk about growing your business, need legal help. The exclamation point was um, the organizer's idea. Five ways successful businesses handle legal challenges. Um, but what I, I want you to do is I don't want you to actually uh, look at the other side because I want you to take out a pen and take notes. And you see the way the chart is organized is to help. This is a learning experience and our goal is to help you take action to make your business successful. So this is an interactive experience. I would like each of you to take out a pen and write down what we're talking about in the five items. Maybe a point that I said, maybe a point that Drawer said, and then in the column that says me, that's really about you. I want you, each person to write down an action. Where are the papers? They're, they're circulated around. Um, everyone write down one action item that you're going to do to take care of this area of your business. Because we could present a lot of good ideas and uh, you're going to be, oh, that's fantastic, but at the same time you're not going to implement it. So our goal is that you're going to come out of here with an action plan on how you're going to make sure your business is going to be successful based on what we've learned. Drawer is a McCarter in English. It's been now 25 years in practice, both as in-house counsel and as in private practice, in venture uh, capital and in intellectual property and in building businesses. And our practice is in the fields of family enterprises, family, um, family offices. We deal with transactions and litigation. So we have seen a lot of the ways things can go wrong and we get a lot of calls from clients when things have gone wrong. Now, you want to sit there? Should we both sit down maybe? I think it's best. Okay, yeah. but I don't know if this is, in the, is this blocking anyone? Should we take this down? The podium? Is there someone who could take the podium down? Okay, we're going to take the podium down. Yeah. They have a... Uh, there's no, there's no workers' compensation <laughs> for us. Can you up on that side? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll let him do it. Because if we break it, not only we'll be liable. You see, we're thinking like lawyers. If we get injured, we're not on the job. We're not going to get paid for injuries. And if we break it, they're going to ask us for the money. So let the staff take care of it. Okay. So item number one, we're going to talk about putting it in writing. And one of the fundamental issues that we see is lawyers, and, and Dror is going to talk about his experience, but... If we were going to make a partnership right now, Drawer and I, we could have a, a brief discussion about how we're going to split the profits, who's going to do what, and I could bet you if we had a five minute conversation here about partnership, after a few minutes we're going to get bogged down in the details and we're going to say, you know, Drawer, let's forget about it. Let's just get to work. Who has time to write all these documents? And what happens is that afterwards all the issues that we didn't take the time to think through are going to come back and we don't have anything in writing. And as well, did we agree to 50-50? Did we agree to 60-40? What about that case that he brought in from uh, his old place of business? Is, does he get 100% or 80%? We didn't really think things, think these things through. So that's putting it in writing. And that applies internally in your business and externally. So, Drew, you want to address that? Yeah. I mean, let, let's take a step back and think about the purpose of agreements. I, I always say the best agreement is one you sign and you put in the drawer and you never look at it again because things are going well and you don't have a reason to touch it. So really, the, the next time you're going to look at the agreement is when there's a dispute over who's supposed to do what, who's supposed to get what. Uh, and then, you know, lots of people with good faith uh, have machlokas. Um, he recalls it this way, he recalls it this way, um, and that's the basis for misunderstanding. And the flip side of it is it's not just a negative because entering into a contract isn't um, just a task about making sure you have a document if there's a dispute. It also forces you and the other side to consider every scenario and think things through. Uh, so I actually view contract drafting as something very positive uh, because it forces you in a very systematic way to make sure you've addressed uh, all the issues and to make sure that uh, you're on the same page. Uh, in my experience, and maybe David uh, has a different take, but in my experience, most disputes around contracts, are in situ or certainly when there aren't contracts, are when people shook hands but hadn't really had an agreement. Each one thought they had an agreement, but everyone left the room with a different impression of what that agreement was. And having a written contract is a way of forcing the parties to actually document what was agreed to. Good point, Dror. And 
where are you up to now? If you write over here in item one, you write down, put it in writing, something I said, something Drawer said, and then what are you going to do to make sure you go back to your business and put something in writing? So d you don't have to write down 25 things, but do you have a partner? Is the agreement in writing? Do you have a key employee? Is the agreement in writing? Uh, do you have a key supplier? Is the agreement in writing? Do you have a key client? Is the agreement in writing? Put something in there in action. You don't have to put in 50 things, you'll get overwhelmed and then you won't do it. Come up with one contract, that you, one agreement that you have that you're going to put in writing and write it here as an action plan. And there's our, like Drawer said, people do it on handshakes. Some people don't want to hire lawyers, they think they could do it on handshakes, but um, there's been a number of famous cases where people passed away, all their agreements, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, all on uh, handshakes, and then all the money goes to the lawyers afterwards to be able to sort it out. Well, let me just add one, one flip side. Agreements aren't documents that are 60 pages long that start with the whereases and the whoosie whatses. Anything that, that shows an understanding between two people is a legally binding agreement. Uh, so, you know, sometimes people think, okay, I'm going to sign a, a term sheet or a memorandum of understanding or something like that. Uh, and they think I haven't really agreed to anything yet, but unless those documents say this isn't binding, those are agreements also. A purchase order is, a, uh, is an agreement. So when we're talk using the term agreement, it's really any documentation of an understanding between two sides. Next in box two, on under item, write the words insure, I-N-S-U-R-E, and notify. And again, I want you to write it, I'm suggesting you write it instead of looking on the back, you'll have all the notes you need later on, but I just want you to be able to, inter, you know, you learn through writing. So what this is referring to is that the biggest mistake businesses make is they don't buy proper insurance. And they will think that they can get away with it if no accident happened today, then it doesn't matter I didn't have insurance. But the problem is, we had a client that was installing doors for Citibank and there was a uh, notice that the insurance policy was going to come to an end on a certain month and they decided that they would not pay for the last month and they got a new policy starting the next month. Well, a year later, someone sued because a door allegedly fell on, their, on them while they were walking through a Citibank lobby. And even though it was a false claim and the, the bank manager was able to testify that he caught the door, but the fact is they had to pay privately they didn't have the benefit of insurance coverage for the lawyers and for the, um, in this case, we didn't enough paying anything but uh, for the damages, but they could have ended up with a serious liability. So the two pieces are, you have to have proper insurance and based on the risk of your business, $3 million general liability, $30 million if you're running a racetrack, whatever the number is, and then notify the insurance you can't tell how many people say, oh, maybe I shouldn't notify the insurance policy because my premiums are going to go up. But if you don't notify the insurance policy, you may be saving yourselves $1,000 a year in insurance premiums, but you could be costing yourselves millions of dollars in legal fees and in liability if you have to cover it yourself. Sure. In my experience, if you find a good insurance agent, they will be excellent educators to you because it's not just the size of your business, it's the nature of your business. And so if you're online, there are cyber insurance policies you may want to have, data privacy policies. Uh, have a sit down with your insurance agent, walk them through what you're doing, walk them through the financial scale of what you're doing, and they're going to come back to you with recommendations that are very specific to your business if, they do, if they're doing their job right. And how many of you are less, uh, have a lease where you're renting as a tenant and the lease says for your business that you must maintain insurance and after you sign the lease, you never went out and bought the insurance? That is not only a violation of your lease, but you're also holding yourself open to serious exposure. If there's a fire, God forbid, or not only will your goods be lost, but the landlord will then, and his insurance company will come against you for the failure to have insurance and being in breach of contract. So, Right over there in the me column, in number two, think of one area in your business life that you do not have adequate insurance or you're, you agreed to do it and you didn't do it. And write there what that is and make a plan when you're going to do that. The third area is keeping in contact with banks and investors. One, everyone has financial problems. Every business that's successful went through tremendously difficult times. But as lawyers, we see that the clients that are successful in working it out with the banks are the ones that had good relationships with the bank managers. 
You need to go in there and meet your bank manager, the person who's responsible for your loan, and keep in contact with them. Bring them holiday gifts, um, invite them to your, your weddings and bar mitzvahs because when the time is going to come when things are difficult, you need someone who f has a relationship with you who could vouch to the loan committee, you know this guy Shmuley over here, he's really a good guy and he's in hard times and he's going to pull through. When people go into hiding and they say, I can't face the bank, I don't want to talk to them and just treat it as a very, very cold, distant relationship, you're going to get that experience from the bank and the bank will come down very hard because they don't have any relationship they're looking to develop, they're looking to get their money. And uh, that's the same thing with investors. When you have investors on your company regular reporting to them what's going on. Let's say you'd have a horrible year, you lost three million dollars and there's no way out. Imagine if you've been telling them every month, every quarter, this is what's going on, things are not working out as well. I've had clients that have done that and the investors have never asked for a penny back um, from the money. Other people, they don't want to talk to the investors, they try to keep it secret, all of a sudden the investor shows up, where's my money? Well, we lost it six months ago, we didn't tell you. What do you think is going to happen? There's going to be a litigation. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I have to strongly second that. Uh, no surprises really should be your rule with dealing with banks and investors. And put yourself in the shoes of the investment officer or the bank lending officer that you're dealing with. He has management he's reporting to. His worst day is when he has to go and report to them a big loss that comes as a surprise. On the other hand, if he knows things are, are in trouble, he can set the background internally and he'll have much more flexibility early in the time you're facing problems than if the problem's gotten bigger and suddenly you're in a fire drill and you've surprised him or her. So in the me column on number three, then write down a banker that you need to get to know better. Could be your local bank manager, maybe you only have a small line of credit, you have a big one. When are you going to have lunch with him or her? When are you going to meet with your investors and just tell them honestly what's going on? There's, honesty really is the best policy because they will become your allies. So in the column me, write down which banker and investor you're going to meet with. The fourth item is being proactive. So this really relates, you can see the items we've been talking about have been really about being proactive. But the concept here is whatever you don't understand is going to come back to bite you. If you're reading a document or you have a terms of an agreement that you don't understand, you could be sure that that is going to turn into be your worst nightmare at some point in the future. And the same thing is, if you know you're supposed to do something, like all these items we're talking about, but you keep pushing it off, then for sure that's going to come back to... It's like a law of nature, or, or the way Hashem runs the world, is that if you had a responsibility and you pushed it off or you avoided going deeper into the issue to understand it, right there is the Achilles heel. Right in that place is where it's going to turn into a litigation, a dispute, or someone you're not going to have the documentation to back it up. So the key over here is to really look inside yourself. A business owner is really a leader. And he has to be accountable to himself. Where am I cutting corners? Where am I saying, you know what, I could slide another month, I don't have to write down that note. I have an investor, he put in $300,000, he wants a note, an operating agreement, you know what, let's leave it. The lawyer didn't get back to us, it's okay, it's, 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 it's too difficult to get into all the details, let's just leave it on the side. That is setting up a recipe to disaster. Sure. Yeah. And it's going to frame the entire way the dispute that results plays out. If people feel like you're being upfront with them, they're going to cut you slack. They're going to work uh, work with you. Banks, investors, they do, they don't score points for putting companies out of business. It hurts their reputation. So their incentive is to work with you within reason to get you back on your feet. But if you're being sloppy, if, if you're kind of uh, coming at the last minute, if you're doing things late, if you're ignoring covenants and your agreements, uh, that that flexibility is going to go out the door uh, and they're going to, you know, be Bifnei Mishrat Adin in terms of, of lowering the boom on you. Joy, you made a great point over there about covenants and agreements. And I think that really applies over here because what a covenant means, it's in a promise that you're making in an agreement to do or not do something. And a lot of times there's agreements that say you're not going to do this or you will do this by a certain date, like we said before about getting the insurance as a tenant. But you, it's very important to calendar, to have a calendar where you write down these due dates. An example, let's say you have a five-year lease with a three-year renewal. 
but you have to give them 180 days notice if you're renewing or not. How many of you have written that into your calendar with many, many reminders so that day, months before the 180 days comes along, you're already thinking about do you want to renew the lease? You're already in a conversation with the landlord if you can get good terms on the renewal and then when 180 days comes, you've given them the notice. Many, many people don't do that. They wake up 90 days before, or 60 days before, and, you know, we really should renew the lease. They call the landlord, the landlord says, well, you, you want to renew now? Well, here's the price. And then all of a sudden you're in a battle, and you, don't, you may have been actually renewed automatically into the lease, and you don't have a way out. So what is critical is being proactive, calendaring the items. So, number four, write down in the me column. How are you going to be proactive? What is right one thing you don't understand that maybe you signed it or didn't under, sign it yet? What is that one thing and what are you going to do? And what is something that you've been pushing off that your business partner, your wife, your accountant or lawyer has been asking you to do and you haven't done it? Write down that one thing and that's going to be your action item. Number five, pay for the best to get it done right the first time. And I had a client that called me up recently and he said, it was, he was referred to us and he said, I've done very well in real estate by hiring the most expensive lawyers. And he wants to pay the highest rates. And I can see so many deals come to us after the fact or litigations come to us after the fact so people cut corners. F, uh, free, the word free is really a four letter word that starts with F. And it's very important to recognize that when you're getting free advice or someone's going to give it to you on the, on the side, are you really getting that person's full attention? Are you really getting the, whether it's a lawyer or an accountant? I, I have people come to me sometimes and they say, well, our accountant, we asked three different accountants. They told us to set up the corporations this way. Well, they didn't, did you pay those accountants? No, they just gave me 15 minutes of advice. How could someone possibly tell you the right answers and what's going to happen for the next 15 years based on your, strat on your, on your uh, structure and your, your business in 15 minutes. Sure. Uh, so two things. One, you know, with, with the internet and lots of documents being available on the internet, there's a real surge in kind of self-lawyering. Um, I, I can tell you from, from my perspective of my practice group, which really focuses on, on young startup companies, um, you know, we, we constantly, we are unfortunately are making a lot of money kind of being the guys uh, shoveling after the elephants at the end of the parade uh, because we get these messes that, uh, that have been created, um, you know, because people kind of self-lawyered. So it does sound self-serving, but a little bit of more upfront spend can save a lot of service at the end. I go to marketing classes sometimes and they always say that to market our services we have to know the value of our services. So if I'm going to charge a certain rate, I have to be able to explain to a client why it's worth it. But what occurred to me last night when I was thinking about this is really not so much how much I value my services, it's really how much do you, do you the potential client or the client, value yourself. How much do you value your business? If you have hopes that you're going to make hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions or hundreds of millions of dollars over the years, are you seriously thinking you're not going to you're going to do that without investing serious money in proper lawyers and proper accountants do you really value yourself and i get proposals funding proposals from companies guy wants to do a 25 million dollar fish farm okay wonderful he's got all kinds of contacts he's going to make the world's best fish farm oh so where's his on his pro forma budget where's his line for accounting and legal it's not there this is not a serious proposition it's not worth spending a minute on that guy's proposal if he hasn't thought through what it really takes. So the question is how much do you value yourself? When you pay hundreds of dollars an hour for a lawyer or pay thousands of dollars for an engagement or tens of thousands of dollars on a transaction or hundreds of thousands of dollars on a litigation to get it done right, you're really valuing yourself to make sure it gets done right and documented right. Yeah, and let, let me add, it's not just a question of paying the lawyers extra later on to clean up the mess. In some situations, if you don't get it right the first time, you can never recapture it. So for example, if you, do, if you want to patent something and you don't get it right the first time, you get one shot at it. You don't do it right, you don't optimize it, you're not going to get another chance. A lot of times uh, with the granting of stock options and things like that, if you don't do it right the first time, from a tax perspective, you can never do it in the exact same way ever again. So it's not just messes, it has real ramifications on the value of your business going forward. So in the me column, number five, what is one area where you want to take care of yourself by paying for the proper advice? 
something where you've been trying to do it alone or do it on the sly or reading it for yourself, what is that area and what are you going to do to take care of yourself? Now we have a bonus topic because it was only advertised as five ways successful businesses handle legal challenges and this is Drawer's suggestion is to add in about employment. You want to talk about that? Yeah. You know, as you're, as you're building out uh, your team and adding employees and consultants, uh, this is a potential minefield uh, and really a great potential source of source down the road if you don't do it right. So for example, there are very specific criteria of who you can hire as a cons consultant as opposed to an employee, um, who you can hire as an intern. It's actually very hard to hire an intern legally uh, under current law. Um, you, may, you want to set up company policies because you don't want to have discrimination lawsuits uh, in, in the future and you want to show that you have policies that protected uh, employees. So this is a minefield and it's something when you're setting up a business, when you're starting to expand your circle, particularly when you're expanding your circle of employees beyond people that you have a pre-existing relationship with, this is an area to get some advice and set it up correctly uh, because between the the labor departments of states and the tax authorities of states, this is an area that gets challenged very frequently. Dr. that's an excellent point and very important because every, all of us have employees and right now, as many of you may have heard, there's new regulations as extending the number of employees covered for uh, overtime. overtime pay. So it's basically doubled the limit and it could seriously impact your business and there's lots of people out there um, lawyers looking for clients who to sue your company because you didn't pay overtime, wage and labor uh, issues and you, it's very important to be in compliance and I would just suggest that you put over in the column me for the bonus area which is the employment being in compliance in general. In any areas in your business where you know that you're not in compliance, well, first of all if you don't know then get advice. But the second thing is I challenge you to do a little experiment. If you know that you're not in compliance, that you don't have a written agreement with your uh, uh, employees, you're not tracking their hours, you're not paying them over time, and so forth. You're not keeping records of their uh, deficiencies in case you want to fire them. I give you a challenge. I would like you to go out there and just ask for advice to help you measure your exposure. Right now you think you're saving $350 or $35,000 a week, let's say, in payroll by not paying overtime. What is it going to look like if you get caught and sued, how much are you going to have to pay? If you do that calculation, then at least you can make an educated decision whether you really want to take that risk. So that really comes down to being intelligent about this and I think once you see the risk you'll realize it's better to pay the money now and not have this over your head than just imagining that you're never going to get in trouble because as soon as you try to fire somebody you could be guaranteed that they're going to be contacting a lawyer or the Department of Labor at the state or federal level to discuss your practices and especially today whistleblowers, whistleblower statutes are really encouraging people to report their employers and their co-workers so we could debate the philosophy and whether that's a good thing or not, but the actuality is that you're being observed. And just like today, the police, everywhere they go, they're being videotaped. You should feel the same way in your business. Everywhere you go, your bookkeeper is, keep, is keeping eyes. They, whatever they know how you're not paying taxes is something they could use against you. Whatever your employees are not getting paid on time, they could use it against you. Whatever you're deciding to do to cut corners, someone is videotaping it, even if not videotaping it with an actual camcorder at the time, but they are there keeping notes and it's kind of in reserve in the back of their mind. They might love you and come to all your simchas, but it, when, they, when they feel they're getting messed over, they're going to, uh, they, they'll turn. Any yeah. final points on that, Jerome? Yeah, I, mean, I, I hate to end on a real down note, but if your business is struggling, uh, two things you never ever want to miss is paying taxes uh, and paying wages, including accrued vacation time, because those are two instances where even though you've done your business through a corporation, if you're the officer or director of the business, uh, the relevant authorities can come after you personally. That's a good point. And that's, it's really, uh, I think, to turn it into a high note, is that the people who have built successful businesses have all gone through this, um, and it's painful. It's painful to do everything the way it's supposed to be done, and especially as the regulations get more um, intense. But I see from my clients who do it right that really makes a difference, because I can tell you, not only are you uh, laying the foundation for your ability to sleep at night and not have any sort of negative issues, but when you get profit, it'll be real profit, and when you come to sell your business, any intelligent buyer of business is going to come in and say, okay, where's your wage and hour logs? 
Where's all your records, your employee records? Where are all these things? And I was speak, met with a client yesterday who just sold his business for $24 million to a major international company. And he told me that one of the things that sold the deal, he was comparing himself to another company where they work out of the back of a warehouse and the, everything is just chaotic and there's no records and everyone's, you know, the coffee machine is on top next to the computer. And he said what he did is he invested in making professional offices in his factory. And he said when they came in and they saw a conference room and a staff that offered them coffee and there were records and filing cabinets and servers and everything was organized, the deal was sealed because they knew that this was a person they could do business with that they were going to be able to actually buy a reliable company and be able to uh, make, it pro you know, make it even more profitable hopefully when they bought it. So this is your opportunity to really lay the groundwork. Am I a big player? Am I intending to be a big player here and have a serious business? If so, then we've given you six, six items now to really help you be successful in accomplishing this. Our contact information is on the back. Now you can turn over to the other side, which has a summary of the notes and a little information on uh, Drawer and I, and also some phone and uh, email information. Uh, if we can ever help you with anything, we'd be happy to. And the main take-home lesson here is that if you follow through on, the, through on these action items and make yourself a plan to do start on them before the next, let's say, in the next two weeks, you really have taken steps towards building your business. Any final words, Drawer? Have much Amen. Thank you so much.